Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that we can come before you now, that we can listen to your word, that we can reflect upon it. We pray, Lord, that we can understand your will for us this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our passage this week is exactly the sort of passage that preaching straight through a gospel demands we cover. It's the sort of confused and confusing passage that <laughs> preachers just avoid because it's easier to do it that way and nobody will really notice. It's going to take some real work to get something out of it, and yet we know that all of Scripture is useful, that it's all beneficial, so there's got to be something in it for people living in a pandemic in Ottawa. John didn't write this dense little introduction to chapter 7 for no reason or merely to confuse us. And so our task is to understand what's going on here. The first thing we might notice is that between chapters 6 and 7, there's a gap. Jesus is biding his time in Galilee here where it's safe. We don't know exactly how much time has gone on between chapter 6 and 7. It just says that he's staying away from Judea because some folks there want to have him killed, and it's not yet time for that. One commentator puts it this way. They wrote, whatever its relation to the preceding chapters, John 7 begins a section that continues throughout the rest of the narrative. Like we're at a turning point here. Previously in John, Jesus has gone back and forth between Galilee and, Judea and Jerusalem. And now, especially starting in verse 714, almost the entire rest of the gospel is going to take place in Jerusalem. So there's this ominous note in chapter 7, verse 1, that's inaugurating Jesus' confrontation with his opponents, that's going to come to this ultimate climax, this moment of glorification, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. But it's not yet time. We notice in the little passage we read this morning that it's the time of the Feast of Booths, Sukkoth, the Feast of Tabernacles. This is a feast that's about to take place, and you can't ignore that and understand the story. This is one of the biggest events in the Jewish year. Every God-fearing Jew would be expected to mark it. Sukkoth is actually an eight-day autumn festival that commemorates the time Jesus or the Jews were wandering around in the wilderness in Sinai as a people, and they're living in tents, and God is with them as they go. He's showing them where to go. It's marked every single year by people putting up temporary residences, reminders of the tents. Now, this still happens. A few years ago, when we lived in Montreal, there was a big fight that got brought up into the news because people were building these tents on balconies because they, had to, they, wanted, they wanted to be able to fulfill this requirement to live in a tent temporarily for eight days. And the landlords were saying, this is a serious fire hazard. You can't just put a tent wherever you want. And there was a big controversy. Like this, this festival that's marked in this passage is still an ongoing event today. There was no controversy back then, though. Everyone was expected to show up. Everybody's supposed to have a tent or at least one they would go to. They're going to spend time with family. They're going to give thanks for the harvest. It's a fall thing. There's the food is coming in. They're also giving thanks as they recall God's provision during difficult times, especially the time when they wandered in the desert. 
So it's generally understood that this is second only to Passover among Jewish festivals. Like this festival is a big deal. So Jesus, we can understand our reading today, wanted to be more closely associated with Passover as a feast than with Sukkoth or the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. Passover, you might remember, that's the one where they, they slaughter a lamb for the sins of the people. When Jesus speaks of his time not being here yet, he's talking about waiting for Passover when people are less thinking about God's provision and God being with them and more thinking about God forgiving sins and the atonement of a lamb. John is teaching us that up to this point, the people around Jesus still don't really get him. They certainly don't understand his purposes. His brothers in the passage, they're urging him to make a very public appearance to the Feast of Booths, something like a triumphal entry. But it's too soon for Jesus to do that. They want him to make this big show of it, seemingly so that they will regain some of the acclaim, some of the importance they had in the world for a bit. Almost like Jesus is here with them and he's brooding about how he had all these crowds and they've left him, like he's licking his wounds. His brothers know the story, right? They know that he was off healing people. He fed people. They wanted to make him king. And then everything got away from him. And they want to get it back, of course, for Jesus' sake, not for their own, as, you know, obviously they would benefit. But there's a subtlety here that we want to find or we want to see. It says this. It says that your disciples may see the works you are doing. And why I wanted to point that out is that this is a seemingly dormant period in Jesus' ministry. It's a blank. It's like between chapter 6 and 7, there's some period of time. And in that period of time of which we have no real account, we're being told that he was still doing works. They weren't really necessarily being noticed, but Jesus was still bringing the kingdom of God into the world, still healing, still feeding, still reconciling. In other words, during this period of relative silence on the part of Jesus, love is still happening. Comfort for the people is still coming. And I take comfort in that because personally, I go through periods of time where it is really hard to see where Jesus is working in the world. That might just be me, but there are days when I watch the news and think, where's God in all of this? And in this part of John, what we're hearing is there are times when it looks like nothing is going good. But in fact, he's over there doing his thing. At any rate, John is trying to point out that the brothers don't understand Jesus. Jesus himself says as much. He's going to argue that they are thinking like the world, which might have been his claim about the folks who had turned their backs to him and left earlier, right? That they started to think like the world. They started to have worldly material uh, expectations. And they, as he made his purposes clear, they decided to reject him. N.T. Wright clarifies this a little bit for us. He says, the problem which gives the gospel in particular, its particular flavor, Jerusalem and its leaders and opinion formers, both official and unofficial, has come to embody the attitudes of the world. When Jesus goes to Jerusalem, he is indeed showing himself to the world, but it is a world turned against God as it continues to outwardly celebrate a world that doesn't want to know of his strange and loving purposes. And I like that because it captures the tension in the passage as I understand it. The people are gathering in huge numbers. They're coming from everywhere to have the Feast of Booths. They're coming from everywhere at great sacrifice, at great cost to praise, to worship, to pray, to sing to God, all at the exact moment they're rejecting Jesus. The Gospel of John starts with the idea, Jesus is Emmanuel, he is God with them. He is the Word made flesh. He's the light in the darkness. He's going around doing impossible hearings, healings, making claims to divinity. And the well-meaning Jewish folks are missing God being right there with them at the moment that they're getting together to celebrate God. It's deeply ironic. And I believe we've all been there. I know that I have tried to do something good at times, 
and it turned out to accomplish the exact opposite. I'm sure that's not true of anybody else. They were like the proverbial little boy who puts gum in the proverbial girl's hair because he likes her. The people are gathering in Israel to have this huge thing, and they're threatening Jesus at the very same time. So Jesus says, no, 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 it's not my time. I'm not going. And if you read about this and you look at your study Bibles, it's really interesting. Everybody's worked up about how Jesus is contradicting himself, that he says he's not going, but then he goes. Like he's lying or, you know, he can't be trusted and whatever. And people like to make a real meal out of this one. And I think this is just like simple reading. He is asked to make a big, huge, splashy entrance, and he refuses to do that. He's still going to go. He's still going to go perform his religious duty. He's a very religious person, and he's just not going to go under the guise of his own leadership. He's not going to go to be a leader among men. He's not going to go to seek power and glory and honor. He's going to go quietly. He's going to go humbly like a man going to a tent to say thank you to God for all that God has provided. When we give thanks, like at a harvest festival, we don't ignore the fact that we put in a lot of work. We took risks. We worked really hard, but we still have the humility to say thank you. So God in Christ is going to go and do his work here. He's going to show up. He's going to go to the festival, and he's going to take the roles he's supposed to take. He's going to give thanks, and he's going to be a good Jewish person. I find it really interesting, though, that the challenge he believes he's facing at this point, he's very self-aware. It's like all the prophets. Telling the truth makes him unpopular. He calls out the truth by this. He says he's calling evil, evil. And the world doesn't want to hear it. The world likes evil a lot of the time. We've experienced this in our own personal lives, but to use some sort of generic, broad-scale proofs, Gandhi gets killed for trying to bring Hindus and Muslims together. Martin Luther King Jr. gets killed because he wants Black people recognized as people. Oscar Romero gets killed because he wants to see poor people recognized as people. They called out evil, and the world killed them. It's an old story, and sadly, you don't have to look very hard to find it. At any rate, Jesus knows full well if he goes and he speaks the truth at this festival, that they're celebrating the time when God was with his people in the desert and showing them the way forward, and that the good news is that he's with them right now, showing them a new way forward. They're never going to have to do these sacrifices again. They would reject him. They wouldn't want to hear it. They like the party. They like getting together. They're special in this way. They're rejecting him. If they had no reason to make the festivals happen anymore, if they had no reason to make the sacrificial atonements happen anymore, the entire economy was going to collapse. The whole economy of Jerusalem is based on the temple structure. For Jesus to show up at the biggest festival, this is like everybody's in town. All the hotels are full, so to speak. All of the restaurants are full. All the tour guides are busy. And he says, you don't have to do this anymore. You think you're going to be popular? Even if he's right, he's not going to be popular. He wants to show up and say the poor are going to be comforted. The prisoners are going to be set free. Mercy and forgiveness are going to win the day. They would kill him on that day. And he knew it. And it wasn't time for him to die yet. So he's not willing to go there and do this. So he goes quietly, privately, like anybody else, to do what a good Jew would do at the Festival of Booths. When he gets there, the people have gathered and the news about him and his deeds is on everybody's mind. Like this is weird stuff he's been doing and people know it. And they're trying to sort out who this guy is. Well, what is his point? They're talking amongst themselves about healings that make no sense. They're talking about mass gatherings and food that makes no sense. There's big news afloat, and they're trying to figure it out. The talk is muted. They're mumbling quietly because it's controversial. People were scared. They don't want to be counted as being against him just yet. And they don't exactly know where they land. So maybe they don't want to be counted as for him 
just yet. They want to watch it play out a little bit, perhaps. They want to talk together with trusted friends and colleagues, family members. They want to reflect. They want to sort it all out a little bit. They're doing so quietly, away from the authorities, away from the powers, because the authorities and the powers, they're concerned the conversation is even happening. Because if the people start to believe this guy, what's at stake is their entire status quo. And if you're a person in power, you tend to like the status quo. In the life of faith, though, again, we've pretty much all been there. Like, some of us are going to be there now. This times when we're trying to sort out what we believe about Jesus, when we're reading these stories, what is going on here? Like, what happened? What's true? What's not true? And we need quiet. We need times where we don't feel threatened. Times when we're uncertain, but we do know that faith is important. We need to honor these times for ourselves, understand each other, and respect each other when this is going on. Matters of faith are not easy. They're looking, Paul says, into that which you cannot see. That's the point of faith. If it was certainty, it would be simple. For instance, if you are among those who have ever had an experience of crystal clarity of the divine, like you've gotten a direct message from God or an overwhelming sense of peace or comfort or love. You know what your response was to that, right? Within five minutes, your response was, is that true? Did that really just happen? Did God really just talk to me? Not, no. Is my mind being tricked? Would I believe this if somebody else told me this was their experience? This is what we do, do we not? At least for those who have had these experiences, I know I've gone down this road where it's like, this is impossible. I don't know how to, I don't know where to frame this. I don't know where to put it. Even with a clear revelation, it can be hard. So let's have patience with each other. And then the story, it says, among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said he is a good man. Others replied, he deceives the people. Here. I think is where it gets important for us today. There is this deceiving component, the liar who tells us we are not enough, who tells us we are not loved or lovable, who tells us we are unworthy of love or respect or whatever it is we wish to be worthy of. It's tricky that way because if you're not too worried about love, it'll just you know make you think you're not good enough in some other way. From time to time, we wrestle with this, right? We wrestle with the lies. Are we rich enough? Are we good looking enough? Are we whatever enough? And we get deceived into believing we're not. When people declare Jesus being a deceiver in the Gospel of John, what they're doing is being deceived themselves. John is a clever writer. Our story ends with this, right? That some people think Jesus is good. Others think he's deceiving people. And when they talk about deceiving people in the time of John, everybody understood this key term meant the devil, the deceiver, the liar, the one who tricks. The people aren't ready yet to stand up and be counted for their views. They're still preliminary, those who are for and those who are against. And so it's confusing what's going on here. Jesus says he's not going. He comes. The people don't know what's going on. And altogether, it amounts to a tricky passage to preach. One of the resources I use regularly wrote this. I thought it was kind of funny, so I wanted to share it with you. What is the preacher to make of this befuddling narrative? The preacher might explore the notion that the text contains confusion about the nature of Jesus's ministry and mission. The confusion begins with those who know Jesus the best, his brothers, and continues through those who are eager to see him, but do not know what to make of him, the crowd. Jesus's enemies are a bit clearer, at least insofar as they know that Jesus means trouble for them, but they also misunderstand his purpose. Following this vein, the preacher might examine the ways that people misunderstand Jesus's mission and purpose today. For some, he's a good teacher. For others, he is a world-class deceiver whose followers continue to deceive the world. 
even after his death. But what about those who, like his family, know him the best? What are the ways that we also continue to misconstrue Jesus' message and demands? And that is a helpful spot to get to, especially with the news of the last two weeks that reminds us of ways that our church has a ton to atone for and the way it's tried to express love and mercy and forgiveness into the world. It strikes me as helpful because I imagine those of us who are most familiar with Jesus are like his brothers. Those of us who attend church and hear words like blood of the lamb and that doesn't strike us as weird. Those of us who are willing to sing out loud anywhere other than in the shower or in the car by ourselves. Those of us who get out of bed Sunday morning and go somewhere. We are capable of misunderstanding Jesus and his purpose and his mission, just like the brothers. And the more invested we are in seeing him succeed, whatever we mean by that, the more likely it's true. We want people in church, we want them in faith, and we're going to work to make it happen. I also, though, know from experience that we are often like the worst at explaining what we're doing here. Why do we gather together? What does faith have to do with life? What does Jesus have to do with my approach to money, to family, to work, to sex, to everything that happens outside of Sunday morning worship? And that's a shame because we are called to be ready to make that explanation so that when you're in the crowd, you can explain something useful. It's not a defense of faith in the sense of being defensive and justifying our ways, but a defense in the sense that sometimes people are actually looking for a new way to be in the world. Like the Jews who are willing to consider that maybe this Jesus is a positive character worthy of following maybe he's the light of the world we're the best people to help them along the way we're the only people to help them along the way and it's a shame because the result is good hearts good people coming to different conclusions coming to animosity coming to division coming to frustration coming to silence in 1 Peter 3.15, it says we are to honor the Messiah as Lord in our hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. You see, because the hope is hard to explain. It's hard to manage. You look outside, there's not a lot of reason for hope, frankly. So if you have hope, you're going to have to explain it at some point. It assumes that people will notice something about our lifestyle, our tone, our way of talking, and they will want to know more. In 2 Timothy, we read, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. It means that sometimes, even if we're scared, even if it's the dark moments, even if it's the out of season moments, even if we're sure our beliefs are unpopular and likely to make us even more unpopular, we are still called upon to share them. And so we have to be prepared. Preparation is not passive. This is one of the things I think the church has gotten wrong for a long time. Like being the brothers of Jesus did not prepare them to understand him and his purpose, nor to coach him on how to go to Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths. Watching is passive. Sitting on the fringes is passive. Preparation is intentional. It's about being more than just around church-type folks. But it includes things like praying with some kind of regularity, reading the Bible, meditating on the Bible, singing hymns with other Christians, writing in journals, offering hospitality to people who can't offer it back, listening to people who want to rebuke you, but they're fair about it holding our finances with open hands, being on the sides of the oppressed and the marginalized, being fast to forgive, all this kind of stuff is preparation. 
there's this famous quote, and I think it's totally not true that he said it, but this famous quote of St. Francis, it's supposedly he says, teach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. It's most likely not him who said it, but it's a fun idea. In Titus, we read that words are going to be expected. That's why I don't think St. Francis would have done it. It's not biblical. Titus 1.9 says, he must be devoted to the trustworthy message we teach. Then he can use these accurate teachings to encourage people and correct those who oppose the word, being ready to explain what we're doing, why we're doing it, what is motivating us, where does it come from? So what good news comes from this weird passage? And maybe you're going to go back and reread it now to see just how weird it was and try to think how you would have preached it, because that might be a fun thing for you to do. I think it's this. There's this mystifying story in one little part of a larger narrative, and the purpose of the large narrative is totally clear. It's inspired by God, and the idea is that the writer is penning the gospel so that everybody who reads it, everybody who hears it proclaimed, will know that Jesus is the Christ that he's the word made flesh, that he's the light of the world, that when they're mumbling, when they're not sure where they stand, they're in the process of getting where they have to go. That we wouldn't be deceived, but that we would find him in our lives. And when you read the passage and you think about it, they're not sure, right? And what does he do? Knowing full well that they might kill him for coming knowing full well he doesn't have a lot of friends waiting for him in Jerusalem. Even his friends have mostly left him. He walks there anyway. He doesn't make a big, grandiose entrance. But for sure, if everybody's talking about him, they'll notice when he gets there. And so for us, he's coming to us too. Whether we're totally on board, whether we're not at all on board, or there's somewhere in between, he's on his way toward us. That's the story in this little bit of John. So let's pray. And then we'll continue our service. Lord, we thank you that you reach out to us in your own way. That sometimes, Lord, you reach out quietly and mysteriously. Sure, sometimes you're, you're in the storm, but sometimes you're the quiet voice, the gentle voice in the wind. Lord, would you help each of us to be attuned to that voice? Whether we spend plenty of time in your presence and have great knowledge of you, whether we're looking for you now, May we hear your voice. May it dwell within us with clarity, bringing peace, bringing comfort, and bringing joy. We ask it in Jesus' most powerful name. Amen. As I mentioned earlier,